Uh, hello and welcome. My name is Gavin Finley. Today I'm here in Atlanta and uh, visiting with a dear friend, uh, Gary Poisson. I've known for for almost four decades now, eh, Gary? So, I'm getting into that. Yeah, so um, <coughs> Gary and I have uh, had wonderful discussions through the years and we visited Israel together back in 95. Um, we've uh, talked about matters of um, the uh, Messianic movement. Uh, Gary belongs to a wonderful congregation here in Atlanta, Congregation Beth Hillel, and House of Praise, which is uh, which we come up and visit uh, during the feasts uh, because I do it really well here, and uh, have a wonderful seder in, uh, in the springtime Passover, and uh, which belongs to all of us, Gavin. Absolutely, we'll talk about that. In fact, this particular segment will be. Uh, discussing the feasts of Israel, and uh, uh, so um, and the unhitching. Well, I'm glad you brought up. What's this unhitching thing that we're talking about here, Gary? Well, Gav, I believe <laughs> that there's a movement going on, and it's not of God's purpose, but it's of man's purpose, and maybe those powers and principalities behind the scenes. But there are many, many pastors that are out there right now building large congregations, tickling people's ears and doing things that are false teachings. And, you know, there's a difference between truth and half-truths. Truisms can be very misleading. And there are many pastors out there, a very large one in the Atlanta area right now, who is unhitching the Old Testament from the New and basically saying it has no purpose whatsoever. Mm. You know, I find that very hard to believe logically because if you go to Scripture... And we talk about the word in Messiah, God is the living word. His word endures forever is what people say. So if it endures forever, what part of forever are we unhitching? Yeah. So I, I don't understand the logic behind that. I know the reason why, because it's nefarious, coming from powers and principalities ultimately. Mm -hmm. But you can't unhitch one from the other if the word is the word. He is the word. His word endures forever. How do you unhitch that? Logically, you can't do it. Well, there's also a, an ulterior motive insofar as they would like to uh, identify the Old Testament with the law. And, and they would say the law has been done away with, it's been nailed to the cross, and, and all these half true, well, blatant, un, blatant untruths, untruths uh, based upon um, fuzzy ideas, really. So we've got a prominent minister um, saying that he wants to unhitch the Old Testament from the Christian well, church. I want to, I want to no. address something. They say that it was nailed to the cross and done away with. Who was hung on the cross? On our behalf was our Messiah, God who came in the flesh, Emmanuel. And he said when he walked amongst us, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my midrash, my commandments, my law. Mm -hmm. So how do they reconcile that if it's been nailed permanently to the cross and it has no bearing anymore how do they address the fact if you love me and you have me in your heart you'll keep those laws and commandments by the way those laws and commandments were set forth by God for man's benefit anyway well there's the good news bypassed and smoke screened and cloaked I mean the good news is that the law is not a grievous issue because it's written in the hearts of those who who cry out to God and come to believe and, and follow him. And who love him. Uh, well, that's an old, old story. It goes all the way back uh, to the Garden of Eden, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, and all the saints in the Old Testament, uh, it was no big deal for Rahab the harlot to, uh, to um, say, look, I, I want to go with, with you people. I want, I, I want to go with your God. And uh, to hide the, um, the spies... <laughs> Uh, little things like that indicating a, a dramatic change of heart or a, a commitment to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in all sorts of different ways. Uh, well, that's the commitment level, Gav. Yeah. Because with these teachings that are out there today and unhitching and all this prosperity movement that you can have anything you want, what started in the 70s, you can name it and claim it and God will give you anything, they've taken scripture out of context you can have anything that's a desire of your heart, but if you've invited Messiah into your heart, your desires aren't what they once were. Mm. And, and yeah. so things 
change dramatically, but if you look at the, the fact that, you know, they say it was nailed, it's done away with and what have you, those are false teachings. The prosperity teaching as it's being taught in the church in generality is a false teaching based on half-truths rather than the full word and truth. You've got teachings that are out there um, that are just outright bizarre and have nothing with no scriptural basis behind them whatsoever. But these people who are following these men and women that are preaching these gospels, which are, by the way, not gospels of God, but their own workings within it and their own manipulation of God's word, there's going to come a day, and it may be sooner than, than later, that we've all heard about the great gathering and harvest and the great falling away. And what, one of the things that's going to be part of that great falling away, and it saddens my heart, is many of these people were misled not by God, and not by his word, but by men and women who manipulated God's word. But what is mankind going to do when they fall away and things don't turn out the way they were told? They're going to rail and shake their fist well, at they'll God. Be, they'll be angry at God. Not the uh, people who led, misled that, them. That's amazing, isn't it? That people will... People will be hurt by uh, by false teaching, and then when the when the uh, the reality finally hits home that they've been misled, they're going to blame God. I mean, this this indicates, I suppose, the mystery of iniquity, which which we don't understand. It's, it is a mystery. Why is there a mystery of iniquity? Why do some people rage against God and other people desire to come closer to Him? We don't understand those things. But the fact of the matter is that history as it unfolds, is going to reveal the falling away and the greater glory. And, and, and if Joel promised that the greatest outpouring will occur right at the very be, uh, end of the age, um, when the sun turns to darkness and the moon to blood, and Jesus said that's after the tribulation, right at the very end, he said Joel saw, Joel saw the peak of the Holy Spirit outpouring right at the very end of the age, indicating that the harvest is going to be well watered by the latter rain, well provided for by the Holy Spirit, well energized um, for, for the hearts of men who are being pressed and challenged and persecuted. And so with all this encouragement, why are we saying that, um, that, that the last seven years are a chamber of horrors and that we shouldn't be responsible? That's where things are going to be coming to uh, the full resolution on the chessboard when God says seven more moves to irreversible checkmate. Uh, there has to be an end to the story. If you look at all the great uh, operas, the great um, novels, the um, great plays, the fireworks festival, what did we see? A big climax at the end. But and yep. so that's, uh, that indicates that we're not done yet. We, we, we can't just say, oh, the Jews haven't been saved, so they're never going to be saved. We can't say that Israel is not restored, so Israel's never going to be restored. We can't say that the lost ten tribes are lost, they'll always be lost. We've got to believe what the scriptures say. And if we see in Revelation 7 that God's got to hold all these 12 tribes together, together with every people from every nation, race, and tribe, in a great harvest at the end, well, we've got to believe that that's going to happen under Messiah and that he's going to do the job. It might not appear like it's happening too fast right now, but it can be sped up quite considerably in the squeeze box of the latter days. So, uh, Gav, the only way that the unhitching that we were referring to earlier can take place and these people can manipulate and mislead the masses is by taking and parsing God's word, taking truisms, half-truths, putting them out of context. We live in a society that opens the door for all that to even be taking place right now. We want an instant gratification. We want it to be microwaved in seconds. We want it to be done in a minute's time. We want quick, quick, quick results. So what happens when these pastors or, or whoever they may be are feeding these people the word, they're looking at little snippets. They're taking them out of context and are the people being told read the chapter or two before it and the chapter or two after it to put it in its proper perspective. Is that taking place? Most of the time not. They're taking a snippet, one or two verses 
out of the scriptures and applying it to a concept that may not even be within the realm of yeah, what so was trying to be conveyed. They're cherry picking uh, yes. in order to spin a, um, a line that the people like in terms of... Uh, to tickle their ears. Uh, ear tickling, um, how you can be fixed, how to, how to fix up the uncommitted soul who wants to think that he's Christian. Um, uh, a lot of that is, is, is wasted breath, really, because it's not going to bear fruit. It's going to be wood, hay, and stubble that will be burned up at the end. The, the, ju the true jewels are, are going to come in, in the full commitment that comes from the indwelling Messiah, the indwelling Torah, right? So um, the, as far as unhitching the Old Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul says those things that happened to Israel in days gone by happened for our admonition, the people for whom the ends of the earth have come. In other words... For God's people, as we come to the close of the age, they're going to need that Old Testament info and all the covenants there and all the teachings and the Midrash. They're going to need all that big time. And for a, a churchman to come in and, and chop the Old Testament off is reprehensible, absolutely and totally reprehensible. There's no excuse for that. It's to deceive God's holy people, to commit the sin of Jeroboam, to lead God's people astray. And that's, that's an old, old story, isn't it? But it still exists today. Absolutely. And it's a sad, sad statement, Gavin, that that's even allowed to take place in our world today, but it's happening every, every day. And it grieves me to see that taking place. Am, am I leading a perfect life? Do I know everything in the scriptures perfectly well? No, none of us do. But the more we love God, the more we desire him, the more we're going to walk with him and, and seek him and understand not just seek his word, but take it in and understand it in the heart, not just in the mind. I had somebody once make a statement that I heard. They read the entire Bible in, I don't know, whatever it was, a week or two. And I said, well, that's wonderful. But how much of it did you take into the heart? How much of it do you, do you know? To me, I've got to read the scripture. Maybe it's a handful of verses, or maybe it's two chapters or three cha chapters, but then I want to digest it and bring it in and get the fullness out of it and not just super skim over thing like I was in a speed reading class. So one may be coming into the head. The other has an opportunity if you study it in depth. It goes into your head, but it also goes into your heart. And then it goes into your will to walk and to do His will. what is being talked about in the Scriptures. A person, right, who's outside this dimension. He's just outside that wall or outside that window or maybe right next to us here in another dimension as close as the mention of his name. So you read the scriptures, but oh, we can be pipe-smoking theologians in, in a seminary uh, and we're looking at God objectively. Or we can say these words in the Torah, in the New Testament, in all of the scripture, telling a story about somebody I know and I want to walk with. That's the big difference, Amen. isn't it? And that person we want to walk with, himself, Emmanuel, God in the flesh. Over, over and over again referred back to his word in what they refer to as the Old Testament that people were wanting to unhitch. If it had no merit, why did God himself refer back to the Torah numerous times in the New Testament. Mm. Numerous examples, numerous illustrations. And yet, if you look at his word throughout, all of the analogies and all the stories, they may be different people telling the story. At the end of the day, it still has the same message. I mm. love you. I created you. Love me. If you stumble and you ask, I'm there to lift you up. Yes. I'm there to love you unconditionally if you'll just call out to me and love me. Yes. Another element of this Old Testament, New Testament dichotomy, a lot of it came out of uh, 19th century uh, Freemasonic um, attempts to so, sort of deal with people and what they wanted to believe. Um, That's the key, what they wanted to believe. Yeah, uh, and so they wanted to cut off the law in order to have freedom 
Right. Free, free. And, if you, and if you cut uh, the law, Gavin, you've got what lawlessness? Well, it, it, you can be free to do God's will, and that's very wonderful. Like, if we come, if we look back in the Middle Ages, um, a, a young man would do what his father has done and what his father's father has done. A line of tinkers or a line of um, slaters for roofs or a lot of carpenters, or, and their name would be carpenters. Going, and then uh, um, with the coming of the scriptures in the 1500s, people were given an understanding that, hey, God is concerned about me, not just England or France. or He's concerned about me individually. So I have freedom to go and do another profession or another, or seek my fortune in another time or another place or another continent, like coming to America, uh, to find freedom to do that. Uh, freedom to do what? To do good things. Or maybe, in the case of the Edomites, freedom to do bad things. So there we've got the, the end time climax in which you've got freedom loving people, good and evil, um, coming to the point where they're going to have a clash point. And, uh, but Gav, God's word, his commandment, his midrash, does not prevent those people seeking freedom from being free in the aspect that you're talking about. But what it does is it's there to keep the people in check that are the Edomites you refer to that are going to use it as a way to wreak havoc, rape, pillage, plunder, steal, whatever their desire may be. But it, the people that were seeking freedom to start a new life and a new endeavor God's law, God's word, his, his commandments don't stop someone from having that freedom. Absolutely not. There's I mean, nothing in the word that says you can't go out and do that unless it's unrighteous, unless it's something that's going to harm others and be unlawful. Well, he's a God of yea and amen. He's a God of the second chance. He's a God of uh, new beginnings. Uh, I mean, it's pretty, pretty wonderful. God of adventure, God of romance, God of uh, going beyond where you've been before, where your father's been before. Um, going into new areas, uh, being trailblazers, uh, being um, openers of new pathways. Uh, but once it's again, exciting. Once again, the law, the word, the commandment, the midrash, does not prevent somebody from doing that. Well, that's a freedom that's a glorious freedom. Yes. But there's also the element in which um, the people who are tracking along with the pilgrims and puritans are strangers, uh, there's books written about saints and strangers, you know, about basically the America uh, as they as they first sailed out from England. There was saints and there was strangers. There was people who wanted to escape because of their past and they wanted to to do bad things in a new land, uh, free of having to be restrained back in the old country. Hey, I, I can go and do what I've done. Well, please, you know. And then there's the people who wanted to do what God wanted them to do and they were forbidden to do it because of the high church in England sure, or because of the, um, the Vatican in, on, in Europe. But once again, let's separate that. That was not God's word. That was man's word yeah. coming out of the Vatican yeah. from the archbishop, whoever it may have been. Those were things that were manifestations of man mm -hmm. manipulating God's word rather than God's word being taken as what it is. Yeah. So th there's no need for us to assume that we have to unhitch a nasty Old Testament God is restricting us from having fun, um, with the, which is a sort of subtle implication behind all that. Hey, um, he's too restrictive. He's a patriarchal God uh, in, a matri in an increasingly matriarchal society. He is a God who is non-inclusive. He's exclusive. Uh, hey, look at the Revelation chapter 7. There's people from every nation, race, and tribe. There's your multiculturalism that works there um, under God. And uh, all the other multiculturalisms uh, lead to war and wrangling and trouble in the committee rooms of the UN. Uh, well, that's creation of man, not yeah, God. Yeah. So um, this unhitching issue, well, that needs to be unhitched uh, from our. Um... Actually, it's blasphemy, and it's an it's an apostasy. Mm -hmm. This is we talk about the apostate church. Oh, well, uh, yeah. That that's a manifestation in its own right. Because it's a slander against against the God who manifests in the Old Testament initially as a God of righteousness, but if he come if Messiah comes into the heart, he just doesn't come in with his altar. He comes in with his throne. You know, he establishes the throne in the heart. You know, uh, let the Lord of Glory be the ruler of my heart. Turn from sin. Turn from sin. 
at the cross of Calvary is where I made the start. Let him reign within. That's not a grievous issue. No. Uh, what, his reigning in a throne in my heart is a delight. Uh, and then he's, when we screw up, there's his altar for mercy. Say, Lord, I messed up here. Um, help me to straighten out and to um, do it better well, as yeah, I move I, forward. I see the beginnings of wanting to, them to create polytheism. Uh, I'm just waiting for the next one to come along because there aren't two gods. There isn't the God of the Old Testament. He was a separate entity from the God of the New Testament. He is one. His yeah. word it was in the beginning. His word endures forever. He is the same then. He was, he is, and he is to come. But all of those are the one God that's not... There was one God. He was the God of the Old Testament. Now we've got a new God. There's only one yeah. God. His word endures forever. He yeah. was forever. He was, he is, and he is to come. Yes, yes. So we've got, a, we've got this false dichotomy. And it began way back um, after the death of Solomon at the breach of Jeroboam. And when the, um, the Lost Ten Tribes, who later migrated into Europe and became the Western people, they told the royal Jewish house to, uh, to take a hike and that they wouldn't be associated. And uh, the lost ten tribes were divorced from, uh, by God. And then the only way in which they could be remarried is through the death on the cross of the, uh, the Messiah. And he gave them through the new covenant, as we just read from in, in Jeremiah, um, the law written in the hearts and reconciliation with the God that uh, that they tried to to um, establish a, a relationship with at Sinai, but that covenant broke. And but it was still God, the same God. It's the same God. It's the same law. The law hasn't changed. It's just that the covenant, the deal, in which Israel, the children of Israel, said, "Yeah, we'll we'll obey that." Um, uh, but we don't want to get too close to you. Uh, Moses, you go up to the mountain, uh, let the smoke on the fire on the mountain. It's too frightening for us. Um, that, was, that was a good first step. But obviously, in the journey of the pilgrim journey, God intends for his people to come to that point and say, we're done and we can't do it. We've got to cry out to God as a God of mercy. And if you look at Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, you know, uh, it was a fearful thing for him to see the Lord. Um, I saw the Lord high, and the the um, the, the, the fear of that moment. Uh, the pillars moved, uh, and uh, and God said, "Who will go for us?" And oh, before that, he said, he says, uh, uh, you know, what will be the end of of things, and he said, until the city is destroyed, the land wasted, and uh, tell this people, you know, hard of hearing, uh, people who, who, are, who are just not going to hear me. Uh, and, and Isaiah knows that, hey, this is a this is a bad rap from the God of righteousness, but there is still behind that a God of grace and mercy. And so he says, yeah, that's a pretty bad rap, but there's got to be another part of the story that's got to go on to. Um, to reveal the God of mercy. And so... Um, but once I, again, that God he, of mercy is the same God. Exactly. exactly. So Isaiah says, how long, Lord? Oh, you know, he says, I know that that's not the end of the story. How long? And um, if you can, you can read Isaiah chapter 6, it's absolutely classic. Um, but Isaiah knows that there's a God of mercy behind the, the fearful God that triggers us and, and triggers a lot of the... Um, well, God People that can be triggered today uh, who, who want to react against the Old Testament God and say, oh, he's a harsh, old, patriarchal but God. See, but see, Gavin, that's where they start separating him and making him two different gods. God has more than one nature, just like... It's a dual office in, it, under the order of Melchizedek. Yes, you know? but it's still the same God. Mm. He just has different natures. He's got that one that wants us to live by his law, which was designed for us, and he's got that grace and mercy that he gives everlasting mm. to his children but it's mm. not the god of this one and the god it's still one god forever yeah well we we, we had that experience when we got to school didn't we there was there was a teacher's pet and then there was the others that 
saw the other side, <laughs> the other side of the teacher. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I always had a good relationship with the teachers. When I screwed up, I was the last person in the class to screw up. And so when I screwed up, in comes a teacher. Who gets it? I get it. <laughs> I get it. Even though these go, these other people are well, you are, bore uh, you bore what all those others yeah, have that's created. Right. <laughs> yeah, but um, but nevertheless, uh, generally speaking, um, I, I wanted to learn. Uh, I got rambunctious at times, um, as Australians are inclined to do. I went from Australian classrooms to Canadian classrooms and the U.S. classrooms. I can tell you what the Australians cl classrooms. They were pretty rambunctious compared to the American, the American classrooms. I mean, people, people were pretty. The kids were pretty obedient, um, and and then when, now we know because the bulldozings of evangelical faith have gone into America, which has reflected a, a, a greater sense of uh, law and order. At least that was the case. Sure. It's not so much the case now, but um, uh, the teacher's pet knows one side of the teacher and then the rat bag guy knows another side of the teacher but it's the same teacher right it well, yeah. depends on how you relate to the teacher absolutely yeah. you know you you brought up jeremiah you've brought up isaiah ezekiel all the prophets that are in the tanakh or the old testament you know we could have another discussion and i think that would be a a, a good thing to have sometime that those prophecies that were set forth by these gentlemen which was coming from god weren't just applicable to the people of the Old Testament, but they're applica mm. applicable to the body of believers today in many ways, and we lose sight of that as well. And so by the unhitching of the Old Testament and those prophets and what they foretold, they're unhitching something that God had a message for the church today mm. that's being missed if they unhitch it. Because there are statements in there pointing to not just the people of then, but the believers of today. And I think that would be a good good conversation sometime, Gav, but I've really enjoyed doing this this morning. I well, really um, enjoy getting together as we've done over the years, having these conversations. Uh, hopefully we open up the minds and hearts, more, more importantly the hearts, yes, of yes. people that are out there that have watched this video and other videos. And I commend you for the great work that you're doing on behalf of the Lord. You've done many of these videos with many people, and hopefully they touch people in fullness and in truth. But I thank you, Gavin, for this opportunity. Thanks so much, Gary. It's been another good conversation. Amen to that. And um, we left our brothers and sisters with uh, the important truth that the Old Testament is very definitely not to be unhitched from Amen. our faith. Amen because to it's that. Key, it's a key to uh, our faith, uh, the Old Testament uh, is the New Testament concealed. Uh, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Gav. Thanks. Thanks to you too, Gary. This has been great.